$1,000. And if you have sat there with somebody, someone who said, well, I don't do the stuff because I could have learned how. I was certainly capable. I decided not to, and here's why. It's a moral decision. It becomes quite easy to say, well, if you have a virus, I'm not going to give you a virus. You know, that's, that's small. That's easy. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions this time about these issues and how to approach them in my practice. Yes? Patient has, you know, patient requests of birth control, and she decides to go somewhere else to get it. Do you make it clear in that initial conversation that your wealth, your willing to manage, maybe her other medications with the knowledge that she's taking that? Yeah, I think it's very important to say, to maintain. You know, there are different schools of thought. Some would say you should just recuse them from their from their care. That's not the way I've approached it. And. I think one of the things that can really help maintain that physician-patient relationship is to say, uh, and Joe Stanford, who's not Utah, I, I obtained this approach from him, is to say to the patient, you know, I'd be happy to do anything else for you. And, and you know, and my patients know that I do. It's not uncommon to call them at 9 o'clock at night and catch them up on paperwork with them. So, the yeah. answer Yes? I can maybe, oh, hello. Explanation of these points that you've given. Uh, the first eight years of my practice, about 40% was OBGYN. And uh, at some point, I decided, you know, from a physiological point of view, that four contraception company, if I was given to whomever, that uh, wanted to avoid abortions, etc., not in Catholic. Uh, but from a medical point of view, I saw a lot of uh, metabolic problems from endocrine uh, interactions, travel for bias, etc. One phrase that this isn't right. And I'd actually left the church for 13 years for this issue, for the decision of uh, Paul VI to be the book and the film not acceptable to Catholic. So I left the church for that reason. So here I was at a kind of this point in my practice, and I said, uh, well, I would give it to him. But I saw these all these medical problems. I said, from a medical point of view, the old men in Rome knew what they were doing. In 1964, I said, the old men in Rome don't understand family life, don't understand my position with four children, don't understand. And so I left the church. But from a medical point of view, it evolved into the situation where they did it for moral reasons, but also there's physiological reasons why they do it. Many physiological reasons. So when it comes to me, and so I had to decide Friday, I'm not going to do this anymore. So 40% of my practice is writing on the line. I'm going to do it anyway. So Monday made a decision not to staff my receptionist says we do not provide uh, or I lost maybe three patients. And I told them, you're free to come to me for whatever. I lost maybe three patients. They bring the children themselves. You have established integrity with those patients, they'll never forget. You're doing what's right for them from a medical point of view. And I said, now I tell them I'm a Catholic with six children. I, for medical reasons, I do not prescribe the pill. From a moral point of view, I don't either because all these four are ex-wife doctors. Now, you're, I'm not denying you anything. There's 4,000 doctors in Kansas City you go to. I said, but before you go to them, I want to explain a couple things. Number one, no dose pill. The instance of you becoming pregnant may be once a year and having a spontaneous abortion. It's not once a year. That's it. You put an IUD, it's possible four times a year you're having abortions. And these are all the other things. No patient that I've ever had come out with an IUD or a contraceptive has ever been explained to them that they're having spontaneous abortions in this situation. 50% of them are core addicts. Okay, so I pulled a lot of strings, okay, literally, some IUDs. So you tell them to be honest with them, says, oh, I'm happy to take care of your family, so you know, and they will go get their birth and they'll kill just they decide. But they need to be informed, talk about informed consent. So the biggest issue that I try to get attorneys say, why don't you raise this issue about informed consent about all the side effects of your children? So you've done two things. You've done the right job morally. You inform them about the potential problems with it, and you establish it your integrity with their patient in the concrete. So that's how I handle it. I give them the information, get them very tactical, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I had a 15 year old girl come to me and said, Well, I want to work to fill the milk. And I sat down and listened to her until then. She stopped out anger. She called me at age 21, said, Doctor, so everything in the 20s that happened to me has happened to me as a result. And uh, true, truth is your sword. It's a very powerful tool. And it takes guts to do it. And 40% of my practice right on life and what we 
and the second hour of faith, the gospel will take great. I've never doubt that. I've been practicing 38 years, and I'm uh, not a retired issuer, so, you know, I've, I've been there and done that. So, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I've always felt the side effect profile of the normal birth control is really bad. I mean, even if you compare it to just the amniotic, it's a terrible side effect profile, right? So, then last year, we're in there, isn't it? I've always thought that the reason that these drugs are prescribed as frequently as they are is because of how much of the nature of what they do. Do you think the side effect profile of those kind of drugs is, is really that bad compared to like amniotic or some other kind of like there, things? So I always use that as a, as a reason for encouraging people not to do it, which is strictly medical. Right. Bad drugs, me. I think that's a great comparison. Yes. I think I, I think I've seen it overstated, I, and I know I've seen it understated. The, there was an article in one of the quarterly, early this year, I want to say, by Rebecca and Morris and Moby Giant in Georgetown. Uh, about informed consent for birth control pill risk, risk and and uh, you know a lot of things in there that are not common knowledge uh, and and this is available through the Leonard Quarterly website but uh, I think one of the most salient ones is the breast cancer cervical cancer we we've all heard and seen in the paper that the birth control pill lowers ovarian cancer the ovarian cancer is a lot less common than breast cancer a lot less common cervical cancer. It's incontrovertible conventionally that the birth control pill raises cervical cancer. It is a list factor listed right next to cigarettes and HPV. Yes, sir. I think that if you look at it from an OBGYN standpoint, which is kind of my side of this, is that if you look at 5% of the population, adult white population, Caucasian or mixed race, has a factor 5 lining defect, is heterozygous, and actually in some populations higher. And if you're in Appalachia and 40% of your patients smoke, the real risk is pulmonary embolus and venous thrombosis, mm -hmm. which is, is absolutely unbelievably linked to the, to the birth control pills and to use of these hormonal contraceptives. I mean, it's, I mean, it's absolutely every week in my office I see somebody's come in with a DVT or and or pulmonary embolus. Either they do smoke or they don't smoke or did smoke, and they were on, and always is triggered by oral contraceptives, virtually every time. And nobody talks about that, and nobody tests for it. And I've asked uh, Big Muppy, Mucks of ACOG, about this. You know, my response, my response was that costs too much money. <laughs> that costs too much money. So my response to that is, well, if you think it's so great, then you should screen for this known risk factor that five percent, one in twenty women has, that place them a Huge increased risk for pulmonary embolism and GPT. And I understand the statistics on factor five light and 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 the are are huge, absolutely huge. That's true. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a story in the uh, paper today, or has been for about a week or so, of a, uh, a mentally handicapped woman who is uh, has the uh, she's she's about stuck at about eight years old in her mentality and so forth. Way she lives. Uh, but she got pregnant, and now a judge is forcing her to have an abortion. Um, how do you deal with patients that come to you that do have a mental handicap but are continually getting pregnant? This is something that I've heard from many physicians, students, and residents who uh, have this struggle when you've got someone who just mentally isn't able to take care of themselves. How do you counsel that situation? That's a very tough question. Not one I've encountered a lot. I, I think of one patient of mine, and the way I've approached her uh, is the same as I approach everyone else. I, I try to keep counseling. I, I, I try to keep it on a real, on a real, uh, you know, simple basis of information. Uh, her mother always comes in with her. Her mother definitely, uh, who does a lot for her and, and her one child, but her mother definitely would. Not one around the pill, um, and uh, you know uh, she has she she's you know I think uh, capable enough to certainly see other providers and has at other times in her life. Um, but there are I think even within what we feel to be conservative ethical moral circles, 
um, debate about, for example, contra you know, I'm thinking about it a little bit differently than you phrased it, uh, the ethics of, of uh, preventing pregnancy and, and those who are mentally handicapped. And, and, I, and I would surmise, not being an expert in this area, not being a moral ethicist myself, just being a general doctor, that this has something to do with their ability to, to even be capable of informed consent. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I do not pretend to have an absolute answer on that question. I certainly, um, you know, am of the opinion that abortion is, is always wrong unless it's to save my life for the mother. I, I um, would not, um, you know, if I was the only uh, person capable of referring someone who had been raped for abortion, um, I, I, that would be a tough one. I mean, this came up in the election, and, and uh, you know, I certainly would give my advice, but uh, I think there's even been, you know, I, well, that's just really tough one, because um, it's certainly a heinous situation, uh, but uh, uh, it's worth mentioning. Any other questions? I just want to add one comment to that uh, moral conundrum. Yes. And these difficult situations arise throughout life, throughout your practice. So, but we must fall back on the basic moral principle. We may never do evil to achieve a good. That's great. We may never do evil to achieve a good. We have to search for other solutions. Yeah, well said. Like the child should not suffer for the sins of the father. Can we not treat both patients? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.